This is a bizarre encounter I had one summer evening up at Mount Hood National Forest, Oregon. It was twilight, my favorite time to be out in nature. I've been an avid fly fisher for decades, and there's nothing quite like standing waist deep in a running stream, lost in my own little world. That evening was like any other, with the sky turning purple and red as the sun went down. With every cast of my lure, I felt that calm descending upon me. I could only hear the water and the forest rustling as the day ended. Sitting in my canoe, waiting for a bite, I got lost in the forest sounds. Insects buzzed around, and every now and then an owl hooted. It was so peaceful, almost unreal. As the evening lingered, shadows stretching and dappling on the water, I decided to try a spot further up the stream. Paddling slowly, I thought about which lures to use, smiling to myself. There is something magical about breathing cool evening air, surrounded by lush foliage, while mentally lining up your next cast. Suddenly, I saw something moving on the bank, a dark shape. It looked large, presumably a bear, I figured, but the fleeting vision quickly disappeared back into the thick undergrowth. My eyes scanned the dense forest, straining against the dying light. I couldn't tell what it was, but it was bigger than any bear I've seen. My pulse quickened a notch at the sheer size of the creature, but I brushed it off, choosing to focus on my fishing. You see all sorts of animals when you spend as much time as I do out in the wilderness. But this was different. After a few casts in the crisp twilight air, I heard an odd sound give way from the forest depths, a deep, resonant bellowing unlike anything I'd ever heard before. It reverberated through the stillness of the twilight, a primitive and raw sound that was enough to send chills down my spine. It was unexpected, unidentifiable, and sounded close. My fishing rod slipped from my hand, forgotten, as I strained to see into the depths of the forest, the dimming twilight adding to my foreboding. All thoughts of fishing, peace, and solitude disappearing, as I wondered what kind of forest creature might have made that terrifying sound. I was preparing to call it a night, the mystery and unease from the forest deciding it for me, when I heard a shuffling closer to the bank. Leaves rustled and branches snapped, indisputable evidence of something massive moving. My heart pounded in my chest, my gut instinct warning me that whatever I was about to encounter was not part of my regular fishing trips. Just like that, the calm of the evening was gone, and all I felt was this intense mix of anticipation and fear. I have never experienced anything quite like this. It felt like I was in a horror movie. It was dark, and there was this strange creature. I felt an eerie uneasiness, the kind that makes your hairs stand up. I remember what happened next so clearly. It's almost strange. I squinted, trying to make out the figure that had suddenly appeared amongst the thick foliage, standing tall and immobile across the river. I held my breath, a mix of curiosity and anxiety gnawing at me. All thoughts of retreat evaporated. I wasn't about to back out now. I could feel it was something extraordinary. Then, as it got darker, I saw it move. The figure was colossal, standing well above eight feet tall. Its hulky and massive form blinked in and out of my sight amongst the trees. I blinked, trying to clear any mirage. It wasn't a bear. No bear could stand that tall and hold still for so long. It looked like a really big person, walking with a wide chest. The creature was tan, light brown, a color that blended exceptionally well with the forest surrounding it. Slowly striding forward at the water's edge, it was dragging an arm casually, taking its time. It looked relaxed, calm even, which in a strange way quieted my pounding heart. From where I was sitting, I could make out notable details. It had a prominent jaw laid under a broad forehead, descending into a sloping skull. The jaw stuck out, looking strong. Its deep eyes were looking at the ground. It was just like the stories. A Sasquatch, maybe. I couldn't help but gasp quietly, realizing what I was seeing. I was observing in the flesh a creature of legends, folklore, and dubious eyewitness accounts. Yet, here it was, Sasquatch. I was on edge, feeling the wildness of it. Also, a strong smell came across the river, almost making me gag. It was rancid, dank, and powerful. 
a scent that spoke of unchecked wilderness, of places untamed by mankind. The figure paused at the water's edge. It growled and then whooped, the sound echoing across the river, the sounds eerily familiar to me now. Its face seemed to turn in my direction, as if sensing my presence. I sat stock still, my heart pounding. It grunted, a bellowing deep bass that resonated across the river to where I sat, wide-eyed and awestruck. Drawing a distinctly ragged breath, the colossal figure ambled on, breaking the river's stillness for a drink. Then, with what looked like a disinterested glance over its massive shoulder, it quickly blended back into the forest, leaving nothing more than slightly disturbed water and an overpowering silence in its wake. On my way back home, thinking about it over and over, I felt this new sense of wonder. All those stories, weird footprints, and shaky videos. After years of skepticism and disbelief, I was now a believer. Days later, I still think about it. What I saw, smelled, and heard. I have yet to return to that spot. A part of me eager to. Hoping for another encounter. Another chance to observe the elusive Sasquatch in its habitat. A couple of years back, I had this strange encounter right in my own backyard in Sedona, Arizona. If you've never been to Sedona, let me tell you, it's quite the place. People around there believe in these energy vortexes, saying they've got some kind of mystical powers. Plus, the place is just stunning at night, with a clear view of the stars sprawling above. So there I was in the summer of 2019, just kicking back by myself one night. I've always found a deep calm staring up at the stars, kind of like they have a way of making all your troubles seem tiny. I had this habit of chilling outside, taking in the quiet of the night. That night was no different. I was lounging on my rickety old lawn chair, feeling the cool desert breeze and listening to nothing but silence. It was my own little slice of heaven to clear my head. I had been lying there for a while watching the stars when something weird happened. I know how it sounds, but I felt this vibration in the air, like everything had a low electric charge, but something I just couldn't put my finger on. The air felt charged, different somehow. Then, as I was looking at the stars near the Pleiades cluster, they started to disappear, just blinked out, like someone was turning off lights in the sky. This big patch of darkness grew, like a shadow spreading across the sky and covering the stars. Everything went quiet, even the little sounds of the night that you don't notice until they're gone. I was there, holding my breath, wondering if my eyes were playing tricks on me. My heart was racing, caught between being scared and excited. I kept thinking, this can't be real. But then, right out of the dark patch, this figure showed up. It looked like a person, but all wrong, like its shape kept changing. It glowed faintly making the whole backyard look otherworldly. I felt this weird pressure in my head, and for a second, everything around me seemed to warp and twist. I'll tell you, it was the most bizarre thing I've ever seen. You might think I was dreaming, or maybe my mind was playing tricks on me, but what happened next was something I could never have imagined. I started hearing whispers in my head, soft and faint at first. They got louder, clearer, until I could tell it was a voice, a real voice. But it wasn't coming through my ears. It was inside my head, a part of me, but also something else. This voice, it talked about journeying across the universe, seeing worlds and life that we can't even begin to understand. Right there in my backyard under the stars, I felt something with me. It wasn't scary or threatening, but peaceful, almost like it was asking me to just be there with it. It didn't look human. It had these big black eyes that seemed to hold the entire night sky within them. It was like it wasn't really there, not like you and me, but I could feel it, as sure as the ground beneath my feet. We somehow shared thoughts and feelings without speaking. It's hard to describe, like we were connecting in a way I've never connected with another person. It was silent, but very clear all at the same time. It also felt like forever, but it could have been just a few moments, then, just as quickly as the encounter started, it was over. The light went away. 
The darkness in the sky pulled back, and the stars were just regular old stars again. The night sounds came back, and that thing, that being with all its mystery and knowledge, was gone. I sat there for the longest time, trying to make sense of it all. That connection I felt was deeper than anything else I've ever known. And let me tell you that it really changed me. Changed because now I was fully aware of how deeply you can connect to another being. The experience made me see things differently, feel differently about our world, other humans, and my place in it. Now, whenever I look up at the stars, I can't help but wonder if someone out there is looking back, and maybe even looking back at me. It might sound out there, but this experience, it's a part of me now. I don't have proof, and maybe that's okay. It was a gift, really, to feel something so incredible and so beyond anything I could think would ever happen. This happened to me about three years back. It's early summer, about 5 a.m., just off the coast of Portland, Maine. It was a beautiful day. The sea was smooth as glass, and the air was salty, just peaceful. Been lobster fishing there for the better part of 20 years, and I tell you, you can't beat a Maine sunrise. That particular morning was gearing up to be another good day at the office. I started my day like always, up before the birds, with the sky clinging to the last bit of night. Had my usual coffee to start the day. I need my caffeine before I can really enjoy that calm sea. I then prepared the Betty Jean, my old but faithful lobster boat, for another day's reward. Hauling traps isn't for everyone, but for me, it beats city life any day. Once Betty Jean was stocked and ready, I shoved off as the first light reflected off the still waters. There's something about being alone out there on the sea. It's hard to explain. As I headed for my traps, I took a deep breath and let the salty air fill my lungs. The smell was stronger that morning. Unusual? Maybe, but I wasn't worried. The sea has a mind of her own. After setting a few traps, I decided to take a little break, stand by the edge of the Betty Jean, watch the ocean, and just slow the world down a bit. But that's when things started getting weird. Suddenly, this weird low rumble broke the quiet. It was somewhere between a roar and a bellow. I felt it through the boat, kind of like standing next to speakers at a concert. A ripple cut across the calm water and I steadied myself. Usually, it's when I haul up a trap that's far heavier than it should be. But something about the day was starting to feel wrong. The air got heavier, like something was about to happen. Subtle changes in the environment, the kind you can only notice when you've spent a lifetime at sea. The water started getting choppy, waves rolled up, and a huge shadow darkened the water below me. Something was out there, something massive and hidden just below the surface. It wasn't fast like a shark. This thing was slow, deliberate, and seemingly undeterred by my presence. Betty Jean swayed with the waves, and I could taste fear mixing with the salt in the air. I was both intrigued and scared. I don't know if it was curiosity or just being dumb, but I couldn't move. My heart was racing. I rubbed my eyes, wondering if it was just lack of sleep or last night's drinks playing tricks. But everything was real. The shadow beneath the water, the cold fear running through my veins. It was all too real. In all my years on the water, I've seen things you wouldn't believe. I've seen blue sharks common as mosquitoes in a swamp, hundreds of dolphins turning the surface of the waves into a playground, and even a wayward orca who forgot to head back north in time. But this, this was different. Whatever was under my boat was huge. Couldn't tell if it was dangerous or not. The whole event was so surreal like something out of a movie. Felt like I was in a movie or something. What was this thing? Some sea monster from old stories? Or was I just seeing things? The water had gone still again. No more rumbling, but that shadow was still there, lurking and giving me the chills. So, the silence was broken yet again, this time by the sharp calls of seagulls, piercing and panicked. They were squabbling and squawking, tumbling over each other as they flew off the island to the east. The sudden burst of avian madness had me glancing over, but my stomach dropped as I saw the cause of their turmoil. The ocean beneath them churned, 
not from the usual cause of hunting fish. This was something incomparably larger. I turned my gaze back to the monstrous shadow cast beneath the Betty Jean. Suddenly, the ocean erupted. Water, seaweed, and brine burst into the air, and something monstrous emerged. Saw these huge tentacles, lots of them, thick and covered in dark scales. They were illuminated by a soft, almost eerie glow under the morning sun. The tentacles slammed back into the ocean, splashing water everywhere. It shook the Betty Jean like a toy boat in a bathtub. I was frozen in fear on the deck, hearing this deep, eerie bellow from under the waves. Then silence, a deafening quiet as even the panicked seagulls had fled. I don't know how long I stood there. It felt like an eternity, but might have only been a few seconds. The creature, and I don't know what else to call it, simply retracted its tentacles and disappeared back into the ocean as suddenly as it had arrived. I stood there in silence, heart hammering in my chest. The Betty Jean swayed gently now on the serene waters. Everything went calm again, like nothing happened, but it didn't feel normal to me anymore. The ocean had changed for me, irrevocably. Every shadow, ripple, or unexplainable sound had me second-guessing my sanity and safety. The creature had disappeared, yet the sense of dread remained, lingering like a bad smell. The rest of the day passed in a blur. My mind was racing, trying to make sense of it all. Was this just a strange, twisted dream? I took solace in the fact that confronting the unknown hadn't completely daunted me. There was some comfort in the familiar, the taste of salty air, the gull's squawks returning to background noise, the constant lapping of the water against the Betty Jean. The sea was back to normal, kind of mocking my own struggle to wrap my head around what happened. The lobster traps remained heavy, but the day had lost its charm. The creature had disappeared, yet its ghostly presence continued to haunt my every moment. Following days found me casting nervous glances into the clear waters, half expecting another behemoth visit. The mystery remained, as deep and fathomless as the ocean itself. For now, I keep on, because as disturbed as I am from the encounter, the sea is my life. Now every morning when I head out, I catch myself saying a little prayer, hoping that whatever's down there stays hidden. A few years back, when the stress of daily life became too much, I found solace in meditation. It usually did the trick, but there's this one experience that still unsettles me. It happened during a trip I took alone to Bryce Canyon in Utah, around the end of August. I was staying in Vegas at that time, and the drive to Bryce Canyon was about four hours, just me and my trusty old pickup with my meditation mat in the back. I'd heard that being in nature could enhance meditation, and the remote beauty of Bryce Canyon seemed like the perfect spot. The thought of meditating as the sun set in such a stunning location was too good to pass up. The peacefulness and solitude, combined with the canyon's natural beauty, seemed like an ideal setting. The day I went, the weather was perfect, sunny with a gentle, cool breeze. I packed a light picnic, set off in my pickup, and soon I was driving through the expansive landscape. It felt like a personal journey of discovery. When I arrived at Bryce Canyon, the sight was even more incredible than I imagined. The sun was turning the canyon into a mix of orange, pink, red, and purple hues. I found a quiet spot, laid out my mat, and sat down. It was silent, save for the occasional whisper of wind through the leaves. As I started to meditate, focusing on my breath, the sun dipped lower, casting long shadows across the canyon walls. But then, I heard something, a subtle rustling in the bushes. At first, I didn't notice as I was deep into my meditation. But after repeatedly hearing it, I started to become aware. I assumed it was a harmless animal, maybe a deer. But the rustling sounds kept changing unsettling me. One minute they were heavy, suggesting something large. The next, they were light and quick. Feeling a bit anxious, I decided to investigate, hoping to scare off whatever was out there. I wasn't expecting any dangerous wildlife since the area wasn't that wild. But I was mistaken, to say the least. Peering into the fading light, 
a shiver ran down my spine, and my instincts told me something was off. That's when my peaceful evening at Bryce Canyon turned into something out of a horror story. Although at that moment I didn't fully understand what I was dealing with. In the bushes, there were eyes that didn't seem to belong to any regular animal. It was something different. And just as this realization hit me, the air turned cold, as if winter had arrived in an instant. More than the chill, it was the abrupt change that shocked me. The rustling noise kept up, but it was the unmistakable feeling of being watched that really got to me. Many know that sensation, the one that makes the hairs on your neck stand up without any apparent reason. I couldn't ignore this deep sense of being observed. Drawn to the shadows, I saw something that made my heart skip a beat. As the sun dipped below the horizon, a shadowy form materialized. It was a large, stooped figure that seemed almost human, yet grotesquely misshapen. Its presence was deeply unsettling. What really unnerved me were its eyes, dull red orbs that fixed on me with an intense stare. I was rooted to the spot, an icy fear gripping me unlike anything I'd ever experienced. This creature moved with a disconcerting fluidity that blurred the line between man and beast. It would drop to all fours, then rise to survey its surroundings, an unnatural predator in the fading light. Tales of skinwalkers from my childhood came flooding back, though I'd never truly believed in them, until now. The tranquility I had felt during meditation was shattered by a surge of panic. All aspirations of calm were forgotten as dread took their place. I was on my feet in an instant, my eyes fixed on the shadow that lurked just beyond the light. Instinct took over, the primal urge to flee drowning out any lingering curiosity. Without fully processing my actions, I was moving, sprinting to my pickup. I started the engine and drove away as fast as I could leaving the silent beauty of Bryce Canyon behind. I had sought a serene retreat in nature, not an encounter with a thing of nightmares. The event left me reeling, forcing me to reconsider what's real and what's merely myth. Could the two intersect? I'm still not sure. That unsettling day at Bryce Canyon has raised more questions than it has given answers. I've not returned to the canyon, nor have I resumed my meditation practices. The call of the wild now carries a note of caution, its charm tinged with wariness. I still hope to muster the courage to return someday, but for now, I stay away. Let me tell you about this one time about three years back, right smack in the middle of Georgia. I'm talking about our infamous swampland a place that's got a reputation for being pretty spooky once the sun goes down. So picture me there, right? I'm in the thick of that swamp with all its weird and wild sounds. You've got crickets playing their tunes, gators belting out their strange croaks, and all sorts of critters making noise. It was just another day at first, me floating in a boat down the waterways, watching birds, snapping pictures, and spotting gators left and right. Come evening, I pitched my little tent, whipped up some food over the fire, and got ready to crash out under a sky full of stars. The swamp was singing its eerie lullaby, but you know what was odd? The quiet. It was too quiet, like the swamp was holding back. Yeah, there were noises, but somehow, they didn't sound like they normally did. Back in the city where I live, I'm used to lots of noise cars, lights buzzing all night long. But out here, it's a whole different ball game, and you need to know what you're hearing to stay safe. When night falls in the swamp, it's so pitch black you might as well be blind without a light. Just sitting by my campfire, I could hear the pop and hiss of the flames, and every so often, a turtle would make a little splash. I was just about to let sleep take me when something cut through the piece like a hot knife through butter. A growl, mean and cold, sent shivers dancing up my spine. Was it a bark? A howl? I couldn't tell, but it sure wasn't any noise I'd heard before. It rolled across the swamp, scaring the bejesus out of me. That's when it hit me. I wasn't alone out there and it's not another human that I'm hearing. I tried to shake it off, telling myself, it's just some swamp critter, but I could feel it in my bones that something wasn't right. 
I was kidding myself if I thought everything was okay. And then, I saw something I'll never forget. There, by the fire, was this shadow that just didn't belong. I'm talking about a beast nearly six feet tall, hunched over and looming like a nightmare. The fire flickered just enough for me to see its matted fur, and the air, it was thick with this heavy sulfur smell. This thing was huge, all muscle, and looked like someone's bad idea of a joke on a dog. Its eyes? They were like red-hot coals, burning right through the darkness. The growl of this thing, it was like thunder on a clear day, scary, deep, and warning, like nature telling you to run for cover. It was one of those sounds that gets right under your skin, makes your heart do somersaults, and puts your nerves on edge. Part of me was trying to be logical, trying really hard to convince myself it's just a normal animal, maybe one that's sick, having a tough time out there. But deep down, I knew better. The fear I felt was primitive, screaming inside me that this creature was something different, something that didn't belong. I should have bolted, should have made a run for it, but my feet might as well have been stuck in swamp mud. I was fixated on this creature, torn between terror and this mad itch to figure out what I was looking at. It snapped its jaws and I'm telling you, those teeth were like knives, shining in the dim light. Then it let out another howl, the kind that makes you think the earth itself is breaking apart. And just like that it was gone, poof, like smoke, leaving nothing but a stink of sulfur and a memory that would haunt my dreams. Looking around, everything was just as I left it. My campsite was calm. The mud still had my boot prints. The tent was where I pitched it. It was like nothing had happened, like the night had stayed peaceful. For a second, I thought maybe I dreamed the whole thing up, but that sulfur smell was too strong, too nasty to be part of a dream. And those eyes, they were too real, too frightening. I packed up at first light and headed back to where people lived, back to where the world made sense. I shared my story with a few buddies, but got the expected chuckles and shakes of the head. It was just a tall tale to them, something stirred up by the swamp's quiet, but I saw something else in their looks, a little spark that maybe, just maybe, they wanted to believe it. I've done my homework since that night. What I saw, it's got a name, a hellhound. That's enough to send a shiver up anyone's spine. I still camp, but it's never solo. I stick with friends and I make sure we're all tucked away in a car long before the sun dips. And as for being alone out there, I learned my lesson. Even when you think you're by yourself in the wild, you're not. There's stuff out there in the dark, stuff beyond what we know. Let me tell you about this one time. I'll never shake it from my memory. It was during a sunrise jog down Santa Monica Beach. You know, there's something special about the quiet of the early morning, how it slowly wakes up and stretches into the hustle and bustle of the day. This happened a while back, around the tail end of 2014. I was living out in California then. I didn't run because I was some kind of fitness freak or health nut. Nah, it was more about clearing the cobwebs from my head, you know? even though it was a bit of a trot from where I lived to the beach. Making that round trip was a solid part of my morning ritual. I'd often get to the beach just as the world was about to wake up, with the sand still cool and the ocean whispering to the shore in the dark. I'd stand there for a sec, take a deep breath of that salty sea air, and just watch as the horizon began to glow with the promise of a new day. This morning was no different. Well, it actually started off even better than usual. I followed the path I knew by heart, from my place, passing through neighborhoods that were still lost in dreams, all the way down to the shores of Santa Monica. The sea was this deep, dark blue, darker even than the sky above, fading into this beautiful mix of colors as your eyes moved up to where the sky was starting to catch fire with the morning light. I hit my stride in time with the ocean's own rhythm my feet keeping beat with the waves that came in wearing foamy white caps, breaking against the wet sand. The sky was putting on a show, all oranges and reds dancing with the blues, just as I got close to the pier. Then, out of nowhere, everything went quiet. I mean, the kind of quiet that's almost loud, you know? 
that's when I felt it, a prickling on the back of my neck like something was off. So I'm there, thinking the world's gone on mute or something, and that's when I see it. Up in the sky, there was something that looked like a plane at first glance, but it was moving all wrong. It was silent, totally silent, and shaped like a perfect sphere, shining like it wasn't from this world at all, catching the sun's early rays in a way that didn't seem natural. This thing, it made a turn that would have had any normal plane falling out of the sky, a sharp, precise slice through the air, and it didn't leave so much as a whisper of itself behind. No contrails. Nothing. My heart was racing, and I wasn't even moving anymore, just standing there with this wild sight that had completely upended my usual peaceful morning. And there I was, just rooted to the spot in the quiet of Santa Monica Beach, trying to make sense of what I was seeing. It hovered there, not looking like it meant any harm, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was seeing something I wasn't supposed to like I'd stumbled onto a secret that was meant to be kept from our eyes. I was stuck there, feet in the sand, eyes locked on this strange visitor that had cut across the morning sky. So there I was, eyes glued to the sky, and this thing, it's getting closer and closer to where I'm standing, and right before my eyes, it starts changing, morphing right there in the open air. It takes on this long, cigar-like shape and gets huge, really huge. The weird thing, though, was the silence. It was like the whole world had gone mute, an unnatural kind of quiet that made the hairs on my arms stand up. The thing had a shine to it, like the belly of a plane when it catches the sun. But this was different. It wasn't just bouncing the light off. It was splitting it, scattering it in all directions, like some kind of floating prism, throwing colors all around like it owned the place. I mean, you couldn't peel your eyes off it if you tried. It glided through the air, so smooth and so fast, and without a sound. No jet trails in the sky, no rumble of engines, just the gentle sound of the waves kissing the beach. And then, I swear, for a second, it felt like it knew I was there. It sounds crazy, doesn't it? But it stopped all its zipping around, and just hovered there, in the air, right across from me. I'm looking up at this thing, trying to make head or tail of it feeling like I've dropped right into the middle of a sci-fi movie. Then, as quick as a flash, it zips off, shooting away into the distance faster than anything I've ever seen. It's gone, and everything comes rushing back. The sound of the waves, the distant noise of the city waking up. It's like I've just woken up from some wild dream, except I'm still standing there on the beach, my morning jog long forgotten. Those morning runs were never the same. I'd catch myself, time and again, scanning the sky, hoping to catch a glimpse of that strange, impossible shape hanging between heaven and earth. I talked to a few buddies about what I saw, and you can guess how that went. Some gave me that look, like they were ready to call the white coats. Others just wanted to see it for themselves. For a moment, it was like I had touched the edge of something massive, something that made you rethink everything. It was a UFO, had to be. It made me see things different, you know? I still hit the beach every morning, and when I'm near that spot by the pier, I can't help but get that buzz, that little kick of excitement. Everything's been normal since then. No more breaks in reality. But if that thing ever decides to come back, I'll be there, ready to just soak it all in, full of wonder. It was about three years ago, on a crisp summer night at Craters of the Moon National Monument in Idaho. It's a spot I've always loved. It's so secluded, so quiet. You're out there in the remote wilderness, and you can really be alone with your thoughts. Perfect for a night of stargazing. Something about the isolation really brings the night sky to life. But out there, under the vast expanse of the Milky Way, the night comes alive in a way no city could match. I drove up with my telescope stuffed in the back of my old pickup truck. It was one of those clear, cold nights where the air actually felt thinner, like you could reach up and pluck a star right out of the sky. I parked at the base of a large hill. Its silhouette stood out against the midnight blue of the night sky, dotted with just millions upon millions of stars. 
I was working on setting up my gear in the bed of my truck while listening to the soft rustling of the wind through the brush and the distant howls of coyotes. There was a hazy cloud of dust blowing across the horizon. There I was, sifting through my gear and set up manuals. When I heard it, a sound cut through the chill night air. It wasn't loud or abrupt, but it was odd. It was a low growl like something you'd hear on one of those nature shows. Deep and guttural, primal you might say. It sent a chill up my spine, and I noticed that the night around me had become eerily silent, a silence that felt heavy, pressing against me with an unnerving stillness. Suddenly, I felt watched, as though eyes were tracing my every move. Panic gripped me, and I felt my muscles tense while my palms began to sweat. Even then, I assured myself it must be a cougar or a badger, something I would at least recognize. But the feeling persisted, I remember thinking how puny, how inconsequential I was in this vast wilderness, completely isolated. A group of owls then decided to hoot simultaneously in the trees, further off. Their hooting provided a strange backdrop to the silence that had settled. The wind picked up, whirling around and causing the dry desert grass to rustle softly. I tried to brush it off, convincing myself that it was just the unfamiliar sounds of the wild messing with my head. But then, something big rustled in the bushes not too far off. A brief flash of yellow, catching the reflection of my headlamp, quickly disappeared in the bush. I squinted hard into the darkness, my heart pounding in my chest. I don't know why, but something in me knew. I knew that it wasn't a regular animal. Its movements hinted at an unsettling intelligence, a calculated presence that felt almost sinister. It wasn't right and this feeling went down my spine and raised the hair on the back of my neck. It felt like a drawn-out moment of dread, the kind where danger lurks in the shadows. As I strained my eyes in the moonlit darkness, I noticed among the jagged black of the lava flows an abnormal outline, taller than any desert shrub had a right to be. My heart skipped a beat or two. It was unnaturally tall and slim, very stark and unnatural. The moonlight reflected off its surface, almost reflective. As my heart pounded, I squinted against the darkness, willing my brain to make sense of the shape. There, against the granite black outline of the lava flows, standing still as a statue, I could completely see this being. It was slender, looking to stand about six feet, maybe taller. It was hard to tell from where I was. It was draped in shadows yet its form was oddly distinct against the stars. My shock gradually gave way to a cold, creeping fascination. This was no ordinary desert creature. I was torn between my opposing instincts to either pack up and leave, or stay and observe. It was otherworldly, and the longer I looked, the clearer it became that I wasn't staring at a human, not even close. I began to notice just how off this thing was. It had a slender torso, with arms ending in what looked like large black claws, just hanging there, motionless. Its head was unfathomable, a chilling echo of some prehistoric beast, complete with a sharp, pronounced snout and evil, piercing eyes. It was as though a prehistoric creature had been plopped right here in the present. My gear lay forgotten as I stared. The wind howled in my ears as somewhere in the distance, a coyote cried out. The figure remained motionless. It was at least an hour before I finally packed up my gear hurriedly, throwing fearful glances over my shoulder. I expected that dreadful figure to charge at me from the dark or disappear altogether, but it did neither. Once safely in my truck, I risked a final glance. It still stood there, a silhouette against the lightning sky, standing tall and still, undeniably real yet horribly unreal at the same time. Fastening my seatbelt, I drove away fast, never looking back. The memory has haunted me, gnawing away at the fringes of my sanity. What could that creature have been? The moonlit desert seemed to have unveiled something ancient, a relic from a bygone era. I returned to Craters of the Moon again, years later and during the day, but it was as ordinary as you would normally expect. I sometimes lean back, gaze up at the sky from my backyard, and wonder if it's still out there amongst the lava. Maybe I'll never know.
You know, it's kind of funny what gets you excited. That feeling of stepping into something new and unknown. For me, it's all about digging into the past. That thrill of poking around in old, forgotten places. Like that huge, empty Packard plant in Detroit, Michigan. You might think I'm a bit odd. I've always stood out a bit from the crowd. So there I was a few days after Halloween in Detroit for work. But I just couldn't ignore the pull of that old, rundown factory. The Packard plant, once a big deal in the car world, was now just an empty shell. It was like it was challenging me, showing off the whole life cycle of big industries. They start, they grow, and eventually, they die and crumble. I had my stuff with me, a flashlight, my camera, and one of those masks to keep out the bad air. You never know what's still hanging around in these old places. With a mix of nosiness and a bit of silly courage, I walked up to the old giant as the day was ending. Pigeons were flitting around, owning the place that used to be full of machine noise and busy people. It was so quiet inside, except for the sound of rainwater dripping through holes in the roof. Now and then, a breeze would blow through the smashed windows, carrying with it the echoes of what this place used to be. The upper floors were dim, barely holding on to the evening light, while the lower levels were just swallowed up in darkness, like the daylight was too scared to go down there. The size of the place, with the shadows and light playing tricks, it turned the normal into something strange and eerie. Steel beams reached up like bare bones, and the ground was covered in broken glass that crunched under my boots. My footsteps echoed around the empty factory, making it feel like it was full of ghosts. The air was thick with the smell of damp, old oil, and rust. It was like you could taste the years with every breath. And just when you think it's all about the emptiness, that's when the place surprises you. The walls were covered in graffiti, like wild tattoos on the building's wrecked skin, showing that people always want to leave their mark. The old machines were just lying there, rusted and silent, like they were asleep in a tomb made of concrete and peeling paint. I kept moving as the evening light gave way to night. There's something about pushing deeper into the dark, where the light can't reach and time seems to stretch out, that really gets to you. It feels heavy. Every little sense is turned up to 11. It's like the uncertainty of it all is alive, buzzing through you. That's what's so cool about exploring old ruins. It's the scare, the rush, the feeling of touching the untouched, and the prize feeling like you're the first person to set foot in there. As I went deeper, the light from my flashlight started playing tricks, bouncing off the huge, rusting machines. Then I heard something, a weird, soft tapping sound, coming from way over in the far corner. It was like a beat, kind of like when a woodpecker goes to town on a tree or a bat in a cave. Super weird. My heart was thumping hard. I shook it off and kept going my light struggling against the thick dark. The noise got louder, weirder, and it sent chills down my spine. And then it just cut off, leaving a silence so thick you felt you could touch it. You know, like when quiet is so intense, it's almost a thing. That's when all those ghost stories I never paid mind to started creeping into my head, making me wonder if coming here was such a hot idea after all. But before I could make up my mind, the darkness changed, like it moved or something. And I had this chill, like someone, or something, was watching me. It wasn't just a hunch either. I could see bits of movement, shadows that didn't belong, all just out of clear sight. My heart was racing. I yelled out, but my voice just bounced around that huge space and didn't find anybody. Then it showed up. It was like the air changed when it arrived, getting heavier, sucking in the light. My flashlight's beam caught something creepy crawling on the ground way off in the shadows, fast and quiet, like a shadow that's come to life. It had skin like a pale, sickly fish, all wrong in this dusty, rusty place. When I saw its face, if you could call it that, it was just gaping dark holes for eyes and a mouth. No nose, no ears, just nothing. The clicking came again, louder, like it was coming for me. I was stuck in place, scared stiff. This thing was terrifying, not just how it looked, but the fear it carried with it. I didn't even decide to run. My legs just went for it. I ran like mad, past the old broken machines, 
and the ghosts of the factory's busy days. The clicking got quieter behind me as I pushed through the dark, desperate for the light outside. When I finally got out, the night air hit me like a wave, and I was gasping for breath like I'd been underwater. My heart wouldn't slow down, and I could still feel those empty eyes on me, like I'd just escaped from something hunting me. Driving back to the hotel, the whole thing kept playing over and over in my head. I couldn't shake the fear or the image of that thing. That plant, with its big empty halls, was home to something now. Something that might never have been human. The Packard plant's got a new story to tell now. One with shadows hiding something dark and strange. It's got this creature, right out of a nightmare, living where all the work used to happen. I've heard all sorts of spooky stories since then, about spirits hanging around old, forgotten spots, becoming part of the place like the bricks and the beams. But nothing stuck with me like the horror and the pull of that thing in the Packard plant. That's the deal with exploring old ruins. They're never really empty. There's a terrible beauty in them. They're telling stories all the time. Stories about what was and what's still there. Stories that feel too real, too close. Stories that should probably stay secret. This happened around a couple of years ago when I was living in San Francisco. As a bit of a night owl and a freelance coder, I kept my own hours, which often found me working long hours in the middle of the night. Anyway, this one time, the city was caught in this remarkably thick fog. Imagine a Sherlock Holmes-style London fog, the kind straight out of a mystery novel. It was late November. It had been a long day, work-wise, my eyes aching from staring at the screen for hours. I needed a break and decided on a midnight stroll. An odd hour for a walk, I know, but the city takes on a different hue at night. However, that night, with the fog that dense, you could barely see beyond a dozen feet in front of you. There was a certain serenity to it, a quiet you do not usually associate with San Francisco. Walking the Golden Gate Bridge at such an ungodly hour, alone as I was, can be quite an unsettling experience. And that night, it was eerily quiet. The fog, it swallowed the sounds. Cars were sparse and the ones that were there passed within seconds. I recall, I was around mid-span of the bridge when I noticed a shifty foggy form in the distance. Thought it was another lonely soul out on a walk. Then again, with the weather being as dreadful as it was, I wondered who else would be crazy to out at this hour. Yet, for someone with an adventure-starved existence like a coder, this felt like venturing into Indiana Jones territory. So, I kept my stroll, eyes curiously trying to catch a hold of the inky form moving within the dense whiteness. It was odd. It seemed like one moment. The shape was small, sort of hunched over. And then the next, it was strangely elongated, towering, like a mischievous imp one moment then a haunting demon the next. A rush of adrenaline, fueled by intrigue and tinged with a dash of terror, began to flood through me. I shook my head trying to clear my thoughts and bring reality back, until a dull growl echoed, a low rumbling sound that amplified in the silent fog and resonated a discomfort deep within me. Something wasn't right. It was more than just another person. It was something ominous, something not normal at all. Yet, my eagerness to understand outweighed the growing sense of unease. As I got closer to the figure, the air became heavier, and a sour smell curled into my nostrils, a sort of mix between burnt flesh and sulfur. I gagged, but gripped the walkway rail tighter, inching closer to the silhouette that was still shifting, playing tricks on my senses. It was only a few feet away when its form became clearer to me. It resembled a creature that was fluid in its form, sometimes short and stocky, other times towering and intimidating. It seemed to thrash and convulse within the fog, twisting and contorting to shapes my mind couldn't comprehend. Its eyes, though, were the constant in this entire encounter, as fluctuating as the creature was. They glowed with a dull red color, like a horrible raging fire. They held a menacing glow and glared at me, not from a height or low on the ground, but from all directions, 
like I was being watched by a dozen demons at once. The fog swirled menacingly around the creature, now resembling a hydra-headed demon, its growl intensified, bone-chilling, like an ensemble of horrendous, pain-filled cries. Fear exploded within me, my heartbeat thundering against my ribcage, but I couldn't run. My feet were anchored to the spot as though held by invisible shackles. Suddenly, the creature lunged forward, swirling faster. The horrid smell became suffocating, its eyes flaring brighter. In that moment, I thought it was the end, but in a heartbeat, the horrible figure vanished, dissolving into the fog like a nightmarish apparition. The growl subsided, and those haunting eyes blinked out of existence. My heart continued to race, but with prevailing silence I found my courage to stagger back the way I had come. But I dared not look backwards, fearful that the demon might re-emerge. I stumbled but also dashed as fast as I could all the way back to my apartment, locking the door behind me. I didn't sleep that night or any other night for a long while. I found myself questioning my sanity, the reliability of my senses, and the wisdom of my bravado. The foggy bridge under the moonlit sky didn't appear serene to me anymore. It wasn't a refuge for me anymore. It was now the scene of my horrifying encounter. The growl still echoes in my ears, and the phantom smell lingers on to this day. And the eyes, those menacing, glowing red eyes, I still feel them on me, especially in the darkest, foggiest nights. That's my encounter. A coder's haunting experience was something more terrifying than anything I thought would ever happen to me. From a regular lover of night walks, I became fearful of the night and a reclusive hermit. And I'm now also a skeptic transformed into a believer, not by choice, but through an encounter with the inexplicable. Ah, the Lizzie Borden bed and breakfast, an enchanting yet hauntingly infamous place, renowned for its dark history. So I thought, why not? See, I've always been a skeptic about the whole ghost thing, but there's just something about that house in Fall River, Massachusetts. The old dark wood, the chilling atmosphere, and the whispers of untold stories lingering in the air. So, me, the skeptic that I am, decided to book a night there. While not a complete non-believer, I have a soft spot for history, especially when it has an eerie tinge. Call it curiosity, call it fascination, whatever it is. The tale of Lizzie Borden had it all. My stay began like it usually does in any lodging. Classic pleasantries, introduction to staff and a brief tour of the premises. Although this one was accompanied by a detailed narrative of the chilling history of the house and its infamous former resident. Talk about setting the mood. The B&B does a fine job of preserving the authenticity of its time. With its Victorian era furnishings, antiquated wallpaper, and the slightly cold, musty scent of aged wood, the place felt like a step back into the 19th century. Like a scene straight out of an old sepia photograph, only I was in it. While the macabre tales echoing in the hallways could curdle the blood, they also tantalized those of us seeking a thrill. And I, in my matchless curiosity, decided to exploit that thrill to the fullest. After dinner rich with stories of unsolved mysteries, I set off to plunge into the depths of the experience for which I had willingly signed up. Led by a guide well-versed in the intricacies of the Borden saga, I, along with a couple of other brave souls, were subjected to a tour of the house. Each room we visited marked a significant chapter in the house's tragic narrative. The sitting room where the stepmother Abby was found dead, the guest room which was the site of Mr. Borden's demise, and of course the room belonging to Lizzie herself. After the intriguing, if not a bit chilling tour, I headed off to my room for the night. The John V. Morse room, the same room where Abby Borden was found lifeless had an air of unease hanging about. Hearing about a room's morbid history is one thing. Spending a night in it is entirely another. Yet, I was more curious than afraid. Once tucked in, every sense heightened, attuned to the unnatural silence of the room, where the occasional creaks of wood felt eerily amplified in the dead quiet. 
but I was there to explore the unknown, to challenge my skepticism. As I lay there in the dim room, awaiting sleep or perhaps something more spectral, a faint humming in the air lingered, an almost palpable sensation, as if the room itself held a ghostly life of its own. And then, it happened. Out of the room's dead silence, the sound of a woman weeping jerked me awake. I remember a chill running its icy fingers along my spine, a feeling of dread creeping over me. I knew the house was a historical landmark, famed for its supernatural residence, but I also knew that the room next door was vacant for the night. The weeping grew in intensity, a soft and mournful sound that echoed sorrowfully in the room's stillness. Something in me stirred, a glimmering spark of curiosity. Is this for real? Is this part of the experience? I wondered. I decided to get to the bottom of it. Slipping into my bathrobe, I cautiously stepped into the dark, dimly lit hallway. With each careful step, met by the resistance of creaking floorboards, the ghostly sobs echoed in my ears, growing louder and more desolate as I reached the door. Taking a deep breath, I pushed the door open, only to reveal an empty room. No spectral figure draped in white, no mournful woman in sight. But the room wasn't empty, not to the senses. It still felt charged with sorrow, the echo of grief dwelling within its walls. With my flashlight's beam cutting through the darkness, I scanned the room, hoping against hope to catch a glimpse or any sign of the supernatural. But all I caught was the old Victorian bed, pillows still fluffed, and the rocking chair sitting peacefully in the corner. The weeping had ceased the moment I swung the door open. Heart pounding and mind buzzing with a mix of fear and disappointment, I retreated back to my room. It was a long night as I laid awake in the bed, alert for any more ghostly weeping, the silence of the room pressing down on me. As dawn ushered in soft rays of light, I lay there, staring at the ceiling, questioning the boundaries of my sanity. Could I have imagined the crying? Was I so engrossed in the historical horror of the house that I dreamed up the tormented weeping? The questions lingered. Checking out later that morning, I was met with a knowing smirk from the front desk clerk as I recounted my tale. I was just another visitor with a ghostly tale to tell. Today, as I pen this chilling experience, the memory of that room, cast in moonlight, and the painstakingly real sounds of weeping, still echoes in my ear. That night, the skeptic within me was silenced, perhaps indefinitely. While I walked into the Lizzie Borden bed and breakfast a skeptic, I walked out a believer. The crying of an unseen woman in an unoccupied room was enough to convince me. Fair warning for all to be ready for the unexpected when embarking on the ghostly realms. Be it weeping women or shifting shadows, the persuasiveness of the other side can be surprisingly unsettling. A few years back, something weird happened to me. It still feels fresh in my mind. It was a warm, clear summer night in late June when I was out camping in Mount Rainier National Park, Washington. I've always enjoyed camping since I was a kid. For me, it wasn't just about escaping. It was also about feeling like I was part of something major and raw. I felt like I fit in out there beneath the huge sky, among trees way older than my great-grandparents. So, I was there settled in my snug little tent after a full day of hiking and fishing. The dying campfire looked like bright orange stars, throwing shadows all over the campsite that swayed with the light night wind. I was in my sleeping bag, hearing an owl hoot far off, the wind shaking the pine branches, and my friend quietly snoring in his tent next to mine. It was really calm. I guess I fell asleep, because the next thing I knew, I woke up all startled. It was dead quiet. Even my friend wasn't snoring anymore. It was really quiet, so quiet that you could hear a pin drop. The fire was out and it was so dark, I couldn't see anything. Everything looked like shadows. I wasn't sure why I woke up, but I felt quite uneasy. My heart began racing before I could figure out why. I was lying around, not really paying attention to anything when I got this creepy feeling, like somebody was spying on me. I can't really describe it well, but it felt like something was hanging over me or pushing down on me. 
I thought it might have been one of the other campers getting a snack in the middle of the night. But I had a feeling it wasn't just that. I had a gut feeling that something was off. The air just didn't feel right. It was as if I could taste fear, kind of like bitter almonds. I was totally freaking out from deep down in my gut. The weird part? I never really saw it. Not like you'd normally see something. Honestly, I felt it. Something fishy, like a dodgy light bulb was going on at the campsite. It was dark, serious, and kind of threatening. It felt like it was checking us out, just observing. But for what, I couldn't tell. And it wasn't entirely quiet. Over the sound of my racing heartbeat, I heard something like breathing, really slow and steady. It was really quiet, practically silent. Unless you were really on edge, you wouldn't have heard a thing. After that, there was this strong, natural smell, way more intense than anything I've ever smelled when I've gone camping, with a hint of something else. I was scared to even budge. Heck, I was barely breathing. My heart was drumming so hard I thought whoever, or whatever, was out there could likely hear it. I was just there, stuck in my sleeping bag like a burrito, wishing it was all a dream that I'd wake up from. But I didn't. It was real. There I was, by myself in the tent, frozen with fear because of this. They kept watching us. So, as you see, it was only the start. Then the creature came out into the open. It sure seemed that way. It felt like something huge was moving behind the tree line. I froze, my gut telling me to hide and stop breathing. Out of nowhere, the moonlight broke through the clouds and lit up the creature. I guess I should thank the moon for that. But what I saw still creeps me out. There was something by the forest, super hard to see given how dark it was. It was huge, definitely taller than any person. Think six or seven feet at least. It looked like it had two legs, kind of like a person but bent really weirdly. Could hardly see its head, but it was a bit like a dinosaur's or a lizard's with a huge, scary mouth. Even with the bad lighting, I could make out that the creature was moss green, same as the stuff growing on a rotting log. Its skin was scaly, sorta like a reptile's, and even kind of shined a bit under the moonlight. The creepiest part was its eyes, glowing yellow, like two small flames in the dark. As I watched, the creature moved a bit, its big form moving smoothly and almost silently. I could tell my friend was also awake in his tent, likely as bothered by the quietness as I was but I didn't dare yell out to him. The animal kept hanging around the edge of the clearing, and then it kind of tilted its head like it was smelling the air or listening to something. I noticed its huge black claws flex and could hear the wind blowing against its scales. I was lying there for what felt like forever, completely frozen in fear. It's funny how fear can either stop you in your tracks or kick you into action. At that time, I was totally stuck, but as the night went on, that intense fear started to fade, especially as morning began to break. I was so tired that it overpowered my fear, and I finally managed to sleep, but it wasn't a peaceful one. When I woke up, the sun was shining on my face. It felt so different in the morning with birds chirping, leaves rustling, and my friends loud snoring. The fear from last night seemed like a faint dream now because of the bright morning. But as soon as I looked towards the forest, I got scared again. When morning came, I saw these huge footprints on the soft ground. It was kind of mocking my short break. I'm not sure what made those marks that night. It could have been Bigfoot, or maybe a bear, or a giant bird walking on two feet. I didn't want to think it was a reptilian. That's not something you'd expect, even when hiking in the wild. But I get this weird feeling whenever I think of those bright eyes. Even now, I sometimes catch myself looking over my shoulder. I still do it even after so many years.